Okay, the last uh, paper is learning SO3 equivalent representations with uh, spherical CNNs. The authors are Carlos uh, Esteves and Costas uh, Danilidis and uh, Mish Macadia and uh, Christine Alec uh, Blanchet. Uh, so the, uh, the Carlos uh, Esteves will present. Good morning. Uh, my name is Carlos Esteves, and I'll present a work on learning SO3 equivariant representations with spherical CNNs. What is equivariance? An equivariant map is a map that commutes with the action of a group, in our case, 3D rotations. Suppose that you have a panoramic image as input, and our map performs semantic segmentation. If our map is equivalent, rotating the panorama is equivalent to rotating the semantic segmentation output. Why does equivalence matter? This is what happens when we train a non-SO3 equivalent CNN without seeing all orientations during training. We could try to improve using data augmentation, but since the space of possible 3D rotations is very large, it will require a large number of training samples. This means an increase in the number of parameters and longer training time. Equivalent representations are a way to overcome these problems. In this talk, we'll show the significance of equivalence in 3D shape analysis. The outputs of tasks such as classification, retrieval, alignment, and part segmentation should be equivalent. So using representations that are equivalent by design is beneficial. Let us consider the model net 40 3D shape classification performance of conventional volumetric, mode view, and point cloud-based approaches. In blue, we show results for training and testing only with azimuthal rotations, which is usually how the results are reported. Now in orange, we show results for training and testing with arbitrary orientations. Notice the accuracy drop in our approaches. In green, we show results for training with azimuthal and testing with arbitrary 3D rotations. Notice the catastrophic impact. As I'll show throughout the talk, equivalent representations greatly reduce both of these gaps. There has been a growing interest in learning equivalent representations, which have shown good results for 2D images with in-plane rotations. They use concepts such as group convolution, enforcing filter symmetry, change to canonical coordinates, and steerability. But how can we achieve equivalence to 3D rotations? One way is through group convolution on SO3 or its quotient spaces. Since SO3 does not act transitively on Euclidean spaces, they are not quotient spaces. This is the reason why this approach cannot be applied to voxel grid representations, for instance. The sphere is a quotient space of SO3, so we can define spherical convolutions that are equivariant. The inputs, filters, and feature maps of our network are always spherical. When dealing with 3D shapes, we first map them to the sphere by ray casting, as shown in the animation. This idea has been used for 3D shape analysis before. It's important to differentiate spherical convolution from spherical correlation. We start with spherical correlation. The animation shows the correlation between the two functions in the bottom right. For each possible rotation of the filter, we compute the inner product and obtain a value. The correlation output is then a function on the rotation group SO3, which we represent here by a circle of spheres. Note that the maximum value is achieved when both inputs are perfectly aligned. Now, the output of the convolution is a function of the sphere, which can be seen as averaging over one dimension of the SO3 correlation output. So the convolution output on the top is the average over the circle of spheres on the bottom. Note that instead of computing the convolution as shown in this animation, we could replace the filter by its average over azimuthal rotations, obtaining a zonal filter, the H prime in the bottom right and integrate over the sphere instead of the rotation group. This greatly reduces the computational cost and simplifies filter parameterization at the cost of having a possibly less discriminative filter. Spherical convolution is the main operation of our method. 
In parallel to our work, Max Welling's group introduced neural networks that performed spherical correlation on the input and SO3 convolutions in subsequent layers. More recently, Rising Condor's group extended the correlation networks to fully operate in the spectral domain. We claim that our approach with spherical convolutions is more efficient and scalable to deeper and wider networks, allowing us to outperform them when compared on the same task. To incorporate spherical filtering in a typical pipeline for classification and retrieval, we must replace convolution and pooling. Pointwise operations like ReLU and batch norm can remain the same. Let's start with the spherical convolution. How to compute spherical convolution for discrete functions? As the filter rotates around the sphere, its shape deforms on the corresponding grid. We can see that spherical convolution cannot be computed as a traditional 2D translational convolution on a spherical grid. An alternative is to consider convolution in the spectral domain, where the representation is independent of sampling. We compute convolution for equiangular grids in the spectral domain. Any band-limited spherical function can be finitely expanded in the spherical harmonics basis, which is shown on the left. With the sampling and convolution theorems, we can compute the spherical convolution exactly as pointwise multiplication of spectral coefficients. This is our spherical convolutional block. First, uh, the spherical Fourier transforms are used to converge to the spectral domain, where we represent frequencies as rows. Note that the zonal filters have only one non-zero coefficient per frequency. The convolution spectrum is then obtained by multiplication with a diagonal matrix, and an inverse spherical Fourier transform brings the output back to the spatial domain. If we were to do a spherical correlation here, these operations would be replaced by more expensive ones, a tensor product of coefficients and a full inverse SO3 Fourier transform. To learn sp spherical filters, we first have to parametrize them. Learning the spatial representation would be straightforward. One disadvantage is that we have no way of controlling the band limit of the filters. This means that learned updates to the filter rates could be lost when we take the Fourier transform. Another disadvantage is that the spherical Fourier transform is an expensive operation itself. It makes sense to parameterize the filters directly in the spectral domain. Here, for an n by n spherical filter, the spectrum has only n coefficients that need to be learned. This approach guarantees the band limit and saves one uh, spherical Fourier transform per convolution. These are some examples of learned filters parameterized in the spectral domain. One problem of this method is that since the filters are not defined spatially, there is no guarantee that they will be localized, which is desirable in neural networks in order to learn hierarchical representations. <clears throat> Our solution is to observe that spectral smoothness corresponds to spatial decay and to enforce spectral smoothness by parametrizing the spectrum with fewer than n coefficients and linearly interpolate between them. We call these coefficients anchor points. This, is, this also allows a number of parameters to be independent of the input resolution. These are some examples of learned localized filters. On the top, we show learned filters with eight anchor points and on the bottom, from left to right, we increase the number of anchors, which results in progressively less localized filters. Now let us consider pooling. Max and average pooling are not good ideas for spherical functions due to the variable pixel size of an equiangular grid. How should we perform pooling then? We experiment with two methods. First, we introduce weighted average pooling which takes into account the area of each pixel in a two-by-two -two window. This is a local operation done spatially that is not guaranteed to preserve band limits. Second, we introduce pooling in the spectral domain that discards all coefficients above some frequency. This is a global operation that preserves band limit and is more efficient since the next inverse spherical Fourier transform is done at lower resolution. 
Here are some examples of learned feature maps at different layers and the final descriptor obtained after global average pooling. We can see that the feature maps are all equivalent to 3D rotations, and the final output is a rotation invariant 3D shape signature. Note that this invariance is approximate because the band limit assumption is not necessarily satisfied when we map our input mesh to the sphere and after applying the ReLU nonlinearity. These are our results for the Shrek 17 retrieval challenge, which consists of shape net objects perturbed by random 3D rotations. The takeaway here is that we match the state of the art with orders of magnitude fewer parameters. Now we zoom in the table, comparing our results directly with the challenge winner. Note how our equivariance network allows you greatly reduce the number of parameters without sacrificing performance. These are our results for our model net 40 shape classification. The takeaway here is that we outperform every other method when 3D rotations are present, either in training and test set or in the test set only. And we zoom in to compare with the state of the art on model net 40. Note that we use less than 1% of the number of parameters and still outperform them under arbitrary orientations. The reasons for the gap in the upright assumption case is that since the spherical convolutions are, are more expensive than conventional convolutions, our networks and in inputs cannot be as large. Our performance may also be limited by the use of zonal filters. Now consider this shape alignment experiment. We are giving some object in a reference orientation and a bunch of queries from the same class at arbitrary orientations. The task is to align each query with the reference. We use our model pre-trained on the classification task, and because the feature maps are equivalent, they can be used to extract the relative orientations between shapes. Since they also carry semantics, we are able to align different instances from the same class, even under large appearance variation. Our lightweight model scales to larger input dimensions and more challenging problems, such as dense labeling. Using residual bottleneck layers, we are able to replace some expensive spherical convolutions by cheaper one-by-one -one convolutions and also use fewer channels without reducing performance. Note how our equivariant model produces roughly the same output no matter the viewpoint. The main takeaway of this work is that SO3 equivariance, good performance, and scalability can be achieved with spherical convolutions and spectral filter parameterization with enforced smoothness. We've shown applications to shape classification, retrieval, alignment, and panorama segmentation, where we match or surpass the state of the art with orders of magnitude fewer parameters when perturbed uh, with arbitrary rotations. Thank you for the attention. Our code is available on GitHub, and please come to our poster for more details. Questions, please? I would have a question. Um, it's about the localization of the filters. Mm -hmm. I assume um, in enforcing the uh, regularity leads to an approximative localized filter, and uh, not exactly localized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and yes. what, what is the decay rate of the filters that you get? By What's the what, sorry? The decay rate. I mean, if you measure the localization, oh, how we, well uh, localized are they? In, in yes, we can choose, control? right? In, in the slide, uh, I can try to go back there. Uh, it depends on the number of anchor points that we choose. We can choose the level of, of localization. So here in the bottom of, of this image, uh, we are uh, increasing the number of anchor points, then we get less localized filters. So if, if our spectrum is constant, if we choose one anchor point, then we have an impulse. And as we add more anchor points, we uh, get less local, localized filters. Mm -hmm. So for our, for our experience, uh, we were using eight uh, anchor points which means that we learn eight uh, weights per uh, filter, which is close to a three by three convolution, which would be learned nine parameters. So we choose eight, and then we, we get filters as the ones in the top there. Have you varied the number of anchor points as well? Yes, uh, we, we ran some experiments. Uh, 
uh, we found that eight was the best for, for, this, uh, for our tasks. Any more questions? If not, I have, I have one. Actually, it's my um, it's very basic question. So what if we um, normalize the orientation of the object in the first hand, actually by using some principal you know, yeah, access, that, something like that? That yeah. works up to a point, right? When we have uh, appearance variation, like uh, if, if we see our shape align experiment, when you have these uh, kinds of inputs, uh, it's hard to normalize with this uh, big variation, interclass va variation, right? We could try PCA or aligning the normals, but it's not very repeatable. And our method, since we're learning a semantic, uh, we can learn the semantics of these objects, we are able to align them more precisely. Okay. All right. No more questions? Okay, then let's thank the speaker again.